Lord be with you. If I can encourage folks to go ahead and get in your cup of coffee and have a seat, uh, we absolutely must end on time today <laughs> because the program is the choir and the choir has to sing eleven. I want to welcome you all. This is the first of a four-part series on music and spirituality. Uh, today is the first session, and then we actually, this, this series doesn't meet again until the end of April. And the reason for that is because Easter's coming, uh, and we have uh, next week Rob Radke. This is going to be great, by the way. Rob Radke is the president of Episcopal Relief and Development. Uh, if, if you have been looking for something else to be proud of about the Episcopal Church, Episcopal Relief and Development is certainly something to be proud of. It does uh, uh, relief and development work all across the globe and is consistently rated among charities of that type near or at the very top uh, for the percentage of your gifts that actually go to, to work as opposed to overhead and for its effectiveness. So Rob Radke is going to be in town. We are blessed and privileged. He's going to preach and do the, the Dean's Forum uh, next Sunday. And then we have Palm Sunday and then we have Easter. And so then we'll come back uh, for the second, third, and fourth parts of this series. Um, what, what we're wanting to do is to, this was a, a parishioner's idea to have this series, uh, and we wanted to provide our, our uh, attendees, our parishioners, uh, with a, a, an introduction to the broad range of ways that we connect with God through music. Anita Cruz was our Lent speaker this past Wednesday, and Anita convinced me, if I needed convincing, that music is the language of God. That there is truth conveyed through music that cannot be conveyed through any other medium of communication. Uh, Anita was persuasive in that regard. And so today, I'm about to turn things over to Bob Simpson and the Cathedral Choir and Parish Choir. I think we probably have some of each uh, that are going to be here today to talk to us about hymnody and, and uh, uh, the way that through our, our hymnody we connect with God. On April 27th, I'm going to present, uh, uh, it, you heard during this launch of our vision plan that we have plans for an alternative worship service. And what I'm going to do on the 27th is introduce you to some of the musical options for that service. We're going to see some clips from a Celtic Eucharist that happens at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Richmond, Virginia, from Coral Compline that happens at St. Mark's Cathedral in Seattle, and from the Gathering Eucharist which happens at St. John's Episcopal Church where I serve before coming to the cathedral. Then on May 11th, we have a treat. Barbara Tucker and her ensemble are going to be here to, to share with us some good old gospel, which will be fantastic. And then on May 18th, Paul English, who many of you know or have been exposed to in the past, will be here uh, to, to play jazz for us and talk to us how we can connect with God through jazz. So this is going to be proved, I, I know, to be a wonderful series. And without taking any more time, I'm going to turn things over to Bob Simpson. Cannon Simpson. Thank you very much. Is that going to do it? That ought to do All it. Right. Put that on there right there. Good. Thank you. This is great to have a chance to actually speak to you. Normally you hear me only through these wonderful voices. And look at all of them. I want to just pay tribute to you. Yes. Yes. There are a lot of people who devote a lot of time to the cathedral, but I can tell you, and calculating fairly accurately, this group spends about 325 hours uh, throughout the year getting ready for 125 services. So there are really heavy duty workers, and I'm so grateful to each and every one of you. Another round of applause. Yeah. For the So, uh, as you already heard, there are going to be three other sessions about the variety of music that can be incorporated into worship. And I thought the way for us to start is to take a look at what is already the standard by which the cathedral judges and uses its music. By a show of hands, how many can definitively show through biblical scripture that Jesus sang? <laughs> Pay attention to the gospel on, on, on Monday, Thursday, because right there, along with everything else, it says, and after they sang a hymn, they went to the Mount of Olives. Jesus sang, and we actually have a pretty good idea of what he sang. It's called the Hala, and it's a set of verses, set of psalms in the Bible, 113 to 118, that is still part of Passover worship. 
So yes, in fact, Jesus and his apostles and all those uh, at his time sang quite regularly. And the Christian sect, that splinter group, took with them this tradition of singing. It continued to be in psalm form in, very, in, in some ways. And, and by the way, we have no idea what the music sounded like. That is lost. But we do know that they sang and that antiphonal psalm singing was a part of worship throughout the history of uh, the Hebrew people. And that was incorporated completely into the Christian tradition. And throughout time, we have been singing hymns and singing psalms and spiritual songs, as Paul admonishes us to do, in one way or another. And so for the next few minutes, I just want to explore with you the astounding variety that we have within our worship already. Turn to the first sheet that you have right there. And this is a very well-known hymn. This is hymn 302. Yep. And so we're going to just sing the opening uh, verse of this. So. By show of hands, how many know that tune? Yeah? OK. Well, that's not as many as I was hoping for, but this is, this is, this is a hymn that's been in our Bible since 1874. So, so we're going <laughs> to <laughs> Christianity itself. And yet we still carry with us that the, the, the message is as modern today as it was so many thousands of years ago. And that's something for us to remember, the timelessness of, of our worship. It is not a modern invention in many cases. It is carried with it throughout the centuries and throughout the centuries. Now the tune comes from the 16th century when uh, we, we had a time when the, uh, in Switzerland there was a group uh, that uh, followed John Calvin and the Genevan Psalter, and this is one of the composers. But the text goes back to the first century, and it's amazing. And it has been sung by Christians throughout that time, throughout the centuries, and still is as current as today. Now, the, so hymns, Jesus sang hymns, we sing hymns, but the dominant force within Christian worship has been psalms. Uh, we know that temple worship included psalmody and very often antiphonal psalmody. And that makes perfect sense when you know the structure of Hebrew poetry. It is called parallelism. And so when you now sing the psalms or read the psalms, you'll see that asterisk in the middle. And that is the fulcrum of a, of a teeter totter. And you'll have on one side, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want on the other side. The balance is, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he restoreth my soul. That parallelism is a Hebrew hallmark of, of all their poetry, and it was not unnoticed by those who sang, so that half could sing the first, the Lord is my shepherd, and it could be answered by the second half, I shall not want. And so antiphonal singing, came through the Jewish tradition to our tradition, to the Christian tradition, and has con continued throughout the centuries to this very day. We have added to that in many ways, and one of the ways that we have is responsorial psalmody, which we use from time to time, where a cantor will stand in front and sing the verses of the psalm, and then we will all respond with a short musical phrase, responsorial psalmody. Something that is specifically Anglican is Anglican chant. 
And at 11 o'clock, we use what's known as a simplified Anglican chant, which is a, which is a less ornate, melodic clothesline on which the words can be hung. But this, this morning, you'll hear the cathedral choir sing Anglican chant. And it is uh, form really a modification of song singing and Gregorian chant that then became harmonized as the Church of England started to get on its feet during the English Reformation. The tune that we're going to be singing this to, however, does not go back to the English Reformation or to the 19th century. It is none other than, don't worry, be happy, Bobby McFerrin. <laughs> <laughs> this is the song chant that he wrote and that we will sing very happily uh, in just a moment in the service. So Cathedral Choir, can I ask you to stand? singing the driver's code or the weather report. <laughs> Today it's going to be partly cloudy and <laughs> And they've made big hits with that. that was a, that's music that can be sung to any text at any time. Unmetered, unmetered psalmody. And in the tradition of the monastic orders that has been incorporated into cathedral worship in England, and, uh, they go through the Psalter of 150 in, in the course of a month. And the way they do that is that they know 15 or 20 chants, and they know the psalms after a couple of months. They've got them pretty down, and so they can just add the, the new text and the new tune together very easily and sing the services and keep them in rotation. But throughout the course of, of time, there has been a greater tradition of metrical psalmody. In fact, it was considered the only proper thing to do would be to sing psalms and as traditions grew, and again, the sense of congregational participation grew, psalms were where people turned to find the songs that the congregation could sing. And so now, if you will turn to page, sheets, we find there, um, um, yes, let's go to sheet three you will find there a metrical setting of Psalm 23 that we sang at communion on, uh, at, at 9 o'clock. And this is, again, a paraphrase of Psalm 23. And it is very reminiscent of the kinds of metrical psalmody that has been sung from, for centuries and centuries. And you all remember it as 645. But the text in various forms, again, Psalm 23, this time in metrical form. And so let's sing the first stanza of that. Three, one, two. leeway was there. 
very little. And there were translations, there's a, a whole subsection of this in which various people tried to put the Psalms in a, in a form that were poetic <coughs> as well as liberal. And that is a very difficult thing. There were lots and lots of very stiff, very uninteresting paraphrases that came out. <laughs> but the person who flipped the switch, who made it, in, who made it possible for there to be something really uh, meaty in the text, and not just a dry recitation, is a guy by the name of Isaac Watts. Isaac Watts wrote 600 hymns, and you'll find one of his most well-known um, and, uh, I think it's sheet number two, is it? Yes. Yeah, now if I can get my sheet number two, I'll be able to read it. Yes, um, I've got it. All right. So, yeah, it's on the back of sheet one. That's how that works. <laughs> He is, he is credited with being the breakout person. Uh, so Isaac Watts is a name that you should just carry with you because uh, he is also uh, the one who composed the text to joy to the world. Uh, when I survey the wondrous cross, Jesus shall reign where e'er the sun. These are all now poetically satisfying paraphrases. Uh, he he um, came, as you can see, he was born in 1674, 1748. That is about the same lifespan as Bach. And, and uh, he wrote this wonderful paraphrase uh, that we all know and love. And let's do a stanza of O oh God, our help in this time. <laughs> So Isaac Watts was the one who broke away and said, it is possible to be faithful and creative at the same time. You do not have to just follow the railroad tracks and not worry about making your own judgment calls on the uses of words. This was a huge, huge breakthrough. And as time went on then, we came to a period where people thought, well, you know, if, if I can be creative with the psalm text, maybe I can just leave the psalm text out and just, just use my mind, just use my, just use my imagination. Hugely, hugely dangerous concept. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, a fellow by the name of uh, Charles Wesley did. Uh, yes. yes. Oh, yeah. So Isaac Watts, Charles Wesley, two guys you just need to hang, to hang on to because about a fourth of, or a fifth of every hymn uh, collection is going to be one of the two. Um, Charles and John, his brother John Wesley, of course, are those lifelong Anglican priests who, once the students at Oxford, started to feel as if maybe people had gotten a little lazy. And so they wanted to kind of buckle down and have a more thoughtful approach to Bible study and to the living of their lives. And so they developed a pretty, pretty straightforward way that they looked at things. Their fellow Oxford students didn't have much patience with this. And so as a taunt, they called them Methodists. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a term of derision. And uh, didn't bother them, them at all. Um, John and Charles became ordained, and they both came over to the Georgia colonies with General Oglethorpe. Uh, John stayed uh, for a while. Charles didn't really take to it and went back. And after returning, he had his moment where his, height was, uh, his heart was strangely warm. And he had this conversion experience and uh, felt that a sense of, 
a sense of uh, emotion had kind of drained itself out of our worship, and he wanted to bring it back and really make something full-blooded. And he communicated that very clearly through his hymns, starting from scratch. And so you will find on uh, sheet uh, four, the sequence hymn for the 11 o'clock service. Charles Wesley's Full 4,000 Tongues to Sing. Uh, let's sing it and then I'll tell you a little bit about it. It's number four and it is in the hymnal, uh, 493. It is absolutely a starting from scratch hymn. Big, big deal. And not only was this a starting from scratch hymn, this is the hymn that he wrote on the first anniversary of his warming. This was written uh, in 1739, the year to the day from the previous Pentecost when he had had that conversion experience. So this is an autobiographical hymn. And in another setting, at another time, it would be wonderful to be able to go through the hymnal and point to the so many ways that people are just pouring their hearts out on the page. And because of our lack of connection, we don't really feel that, but it's there. And it's so important for us to have a chance to, to reconnect in this one case, to see that this person is really telling us of how he felt the year after his life completely changed. And of course, within the 6,000 or more hymns that Charles Wesley composed, we have him to thank for, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Jesus the Christ the Lord is Risen Today, and Love Divine All of Excel, on and on and on. He was, in fact, a genius. There was no, no other way around it. And uh, as I love to point out to my Methodist friends, he and John died good Anglican priests. <laughs> <laughs> no, no qualms about that in the least. <laughs> um, so we have hymns, we have psalms, and then the spiritual songs. Um, there is a moment, of course, when our particular tradition blossomed, the English Reformation. There had been uh, centuries of music that had been written by composers that had been uh, very beautifully crafted. However, perhaps because of the times uh, that uh, came about as the Church of England was formed, it became important that communication with the listener was especially important. And so the word went out that composers were to cut it back and rein it in and make their music very ordinary, not ordinary, but one note per syllable. None of this, what's called a melisma, where you can sing one syllable, ah, go on, 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 on. That uh, is uh, very uh, common for music of all, uh, of all ages. But that was not going to be the case as our tradition began. And there are two uh, wonderful examples of that. The first, I'm going to ask the choir to sing. Thomas Tallis, who lived from 1505 to 1585, so he really uh, started his career under the old system. In fact, he is famous for having written a piece for 40 voices. So it's eight five-voice choirs, uh, spem and alium. So he knew how to handle lots of notes. There was no problem. He could do lots of heavy lifting. So in the midst of his career, he was told, you can't do that anymore, and keep your head. And so he said, okay, I can, I, can, I can live with that. And so he created these jewels. And one of 
that you'll recognize is, if ye love me, again, coming back to the, the upper room and to the, to the uh, farewell discourse of Jesus, and if ye love me, keep my commandments, let's sing this together to people in the parish choir, if you love me. that sounds to us very, sounds very churchy. It sounds what, what we would expect. However, it is groundbreaking. It is, it is some of the first music written for our tradition, for the Anglican tradition. Um, one other is found on page eight in this sheet. And we're going to sing this uh, next Sunday. It is John Narbeck was one of the go-to guys for Cranmer. And when Cranmer put together the prayer book it was John Marbeck who was uh, given the opportunity to set to music. And in 1550, came out with the prayer book, um, uh, um, how, what was it called? This is pointed it's uh, like, the, like the prayer book uh, to, to notes. So what we have here is a, is a piece that we sing every other Sunday during Lent. It's S-157. S-157. This is some of the first music written for our Anglican Church, for the English Church, and here it is on our hymnal. We sing it every Sunday. It's, it's groundbreaking, and we don't know that um, uh, because the traditional uh, mantle has just fallen over it. But... This is, this is a real game changer. Here we are, and let's sing it together. Yeah. But let me, just, let me just review for a second that within our tradition, we have music that's coming from the first century. It's coming through the transitions, the breakthroughs that people had in their own sense of devotion and creativity. 
and it can, comes right up to today. Please come on in. And the way that this is communicated to us and, and to our future generations is through our teaching of children, these traditions. And so I thought it would be very fitting, given the fact that the public choir is about to sing in the 11 o'clock service. And then, as you already know, they're hosting the uh, fiesta afterwards to help their fundraising for, uh, for Carnegie Hall. That the best way to finish this survey of a far from routine kind of background that we inherit and treasure at the cathedral so dearly is by having the voices of the treble choir sing a, a piece from the traditions that we encompass as we look to others around us. So I'm going to just step aside and let the treble choir take over. Thank you. 